All right. Hi, Wayne and Dushan. Thank you so much for joining me today in this conversation about animal rights. Um, as you may know, uh, this conversation is one of many that's taking place as part of our Free Speech for the Left conference with Plevity. And there's a lot of things that I want to cover today. But first, um, let's have you both briefly introduce yourselves. So Wayne, we know who you are, but can you briefly introduce yourselves to people watching? Yeah, my name is Wayne Schoen. I'm most known as a co-founder of a grassroots animal rights network called Direct Action Everywhere. But I'm currently executive director for a, a new initiative called the Simple Heart Initiative, which is focused on building a mass movement for what's called Open Rescue. And Open Rescue is when activists take nonviolent direct action to give aid to animals who are sick, dying, and injured in various abusive facilities, document what they're doing, and then publish it to the world openly. So I'm, I'm really excited to be here because I think free speech and the left have been in tension and <laughs> they need to become more in alignment. So excited to talk a little bit more about that. Awesome. Thank you, Wayne. And Wayne, I think you've done yourself a disservice with that introduction. For people watching, Wayne has, he has done a lot for the animal rights movement. He's participated in animal cruelty investigations. You've been to the Yulin Dog Festival. You've rescued dogs. You've been prosecuted. You've been held in solitary confinement. You're not allowed back in China. I know that. So yeah, you've been done a lot of work. So thank you, Wayne. And Dushan, can you pre please briefly introduce yourselves? Of course. Thank you for having me here. I'm Dushan Bajovic from Montenegro. I'm campaigning coordinator for DM25, first pan-European leftist organization. Uh, I, besides that, I'm also author and writer, and doing, I'm also doing research in critical animal studies. I started my activism with animal rights career, actually, so this is the topic that is always closest to my heart in both research and activism, even though I try to be wide and have all these other topics inside of the same umbrella because I believe in the concept of total liberation, but we can cover that later on. Awesome. Thank you, Dushan. And so, Wayne, you've been vegan for almost 22 years. How long has it been? Yeah, it depends on how you count. I was a yeah. lazy vegan for the first two years, but I, I think I was completely vegan in 2001. I tried going vegan in 1999. So it's either 22 or 24 years, depending on whether you count the two years of sometimes mild, sometimes really egregious cheating. <laughs> All right. Awesome. And what made you go vegan, Wayne? Uh, yeah, you know, that's a, it's a complicated story. And I, I usually give three answers and I'll make them brief. One was uh, there was a girl I liked who was vegan and I wanted to impress her and it didn't work. She, I went vegan and she didn't still didn't care about me, which is great because I found the lifestyle that I really believed in. But the more important reasons and the reasons that stuck are, are twofold. One is I had an experience as a kid um, seeing dogs being beaten to death in China, or at least caged. It's unclear, differing recollections of my family as to whether I actually saw the dogs being hurt, but there's no question that we saw dogs in cages being prepared for slaughter when I was like eight, nine years old in China. Um, but the second thing is intellectually, and, and that was really difficult for me because I love dogs and I still love dogs. They're my best friends. And I think they're beautiful creatures who in many ways have so many lessons to teach us about patience and love and forgiveness. Uh, but the second reason is when I was a teenager, I read a book called Animal Liberation that really just shook me to my core. Um, I read the first sentence of that book, which is, this is a book about the tyranny of human over non-human animals. I thought it was ridiculous, but then I read the book and I thought, this is an extremely compelling argument. And that's where I was able to kind of blend my heart with my my head and realize this is not just this personal feeling I have about animal abuse. This is a political movement that needs to happen. And, and so those are the kind of things that solidified my veganism and made me realize there's a bigger fight here. It's a fight for all life on this earth. And I'm happy to be a part of it. Thank you. And Dushan, how long have you been vegan and, and what made you go vegan? I've been vegan for around six years. I think. And in Montenegro, it was groundbreaking. It was hard, especially for me. I was late teen. I was 19 uh, to come out as a vegan here. <laughs> but uh, it, it has a couple of aspects why I went vegan. First one is cognitive, to say like that, because I was on my first year of university and I was reading some anthropology work by Tim Ingold. And he was writing about the 
horrific uh, torture which is happening inside of industrial animal farms. But and I was like, yeah, this is so wrong. This is so wrong. Why haven't I thought of that before? And then he goes on and says, unlike in a nature where uh, certain tribes are having this harmonious relationship with animals, where they practically, this is even maybe a quote, where practically uh, the animal stands in front of the arrow to be killed because the, uh, the, in that way uh, that person takes away their life and uh, feeds himself, themselves, herself, and so on. And I was like, wait, no, this is wrong for me as well. This sounds even hypocritical. And then I was like, and I am the worst hypocrite of them all because <laughs> I'm, we, I'm not vegan, I'm not vegetarian, and yet this sounds very, very, very wrong. Uh, the first thing I did was ask my professor, can he recommend more literature? And he recommended to me Earthlings, the, the most uh, famous film, uh, that documentary that made a lot of people vegan. And I literally cried so much that I had to watch it in six times. I couldn't do it in one, in one sitting, you know. Oh. So after that, I went vegan. And uh, then I went into the whole theoretical part of uh, Melanie Joy, of Peter Singer, as Wayne mentioned, uh, Steve Best, and, and all the rest. But even since I was a very little, little kid, I remember crying because people are killing animals. And I remember because I, lived, I was living near the coast uh, when my uncle caught a fish. And when fishermen here uh, catch a fish, they put it in a bucket, you know, in the water. They're still alive. And I remember putting my hand in there and she was literally cuddling around my hand. And... I remember crying so much because of that. That's one of my earliest memories, you know. So there are two aspects, cognitive and emotional. Mm. And it all built up for me to become vegan years later. Mm. Oh. And, and Dushan, you're involved in, in DM25. You briefly mentioned that this movement in your intro. Can you explain your involvement in it? in it, what is it? And also how does your animal rights advocacy fit into that? Uh, DM25, to, to say the first thing, uh, was formed by Yanis Varoufakis and Srećko Horvat in 2016. And uh, they realized that national politics cannot do much good because you are going to be crushed by Troika, by international fascism, international capitalism and so on. So we need pan uh, pan-European movement and we started building certain broad left coalitions to cut it short uh, even the left wasn't interested really in being left so we uh, uh, written that we have written that famous Green New Deal for Europe the first Green New Deal for Europe that was described by many actors like Aaron Lucas, James Galbraith, Jason Hickel as, as the best current solution for ecological, economic and crisis of democracy. But they didn't want to run for the EU elections, even the biggest EU parties, because they thought, biggest EU leftist parties, of course, uh, because they thought it's too radical. From what we see now, it wasn't. We really needed that change, and it will be even more radical in our next update. And then we decided to, to form parties uh, that can run with that program. So we have now three parties, one in Greece, in Parliament, actually, one in uh, Italy and one in Germany that have this uh, Green New Deal scaled down for uh, national, uh, national uh, political program. For lo local issues uh, and we are going to run in 2024 again for sure uh, how my animal rights activists fit into this well when i first joined dm i think the first article that i've uh, written because my role back then was uh, green new deal uh, for europe campaigning coordinator which was and still is our most important campaign and policy package the first article that I uh, written was why we need to liberate animals as part of the Green New Deal. 
uh, well, I, where I take this approach in terms of ecology, but also ethics, which is even more important to me if I have to make that distinct, uh, distinction. And after that, uh, it's actually right now in the process of uh, revision, our policy to include animal rights. And this has been approved by coordinating collective. So we are going to have a lot of animal liberation policies inside of our uh, EU program, but also on national programs in these three countries and in many more if we create other parties across Europe, which is also our, our goal. Mm. That's awesome. Yeah, because so often with these Green New Deals and these environmental policies, the animals are often excluded. So it's really nice to see that the merging of those two issues that are very much related. Um, Wayne, you so since you founded Direct Action Everywhere, um, I mean, you've been involved for so many years. What are some of the major changes you've seen from your initial activism to today, good and bad in the movement? Gosh, major changes. I mean, the one of the interesting things about social movements is there's there's just always ebbs and flows. You know, I mean, it's it's not just changes from 1999 to 2023. It's it's changes from 2018 to 2023, right? I mean, COVID-19 obviously had a huge impact on mobilization across probably the globe, certainly in the United States. You know, I think it was extremely damaging. Um, but I'd say big picture, the, the biggest shifts I've seen are one, um, a shift towards grassroots animal rights activism, and especially grassroots activism for farm animals. Uh, there was some grassroots activism for animals used in fur production, animals used in, in laboratories, but a, a general rubric of anti-speciesism didn't really exist. And I, you know, I, I say that not, not because I, I'm trying to inject some sort of purity politics into our movement and saying, oh, you know, those 1980s and 90s actives, they weren't as good as us because they didn't defend farm animals because a lot of them did care about farm animals. I think the main change I've seen since I started is that there's a bigger sense of vision. Um, so we don't necessarily judge the actives in the 80s and 90s, in many cases who are not even vegetarian or vegan, right? If you look at data from the National Animal Rights Conference in like 1993 and 1998, I think in 1993, a majority, majority of the people at the National Animal Rights Conference in the United States were not vegetarian. In 98, I think it was increasingly vegetarian at least, but still farm animals are not a priority. No one even thought of farm animals as an issue. Um, but the main reason I think people did not address the broader concern about anti-speciesism, including farm animals, including even animals in the wild, was because people thought it was just impossible. You know, how, how the hell are we gonna possibly get people to talk about meat? Like 99% of people are eating animal products three times a day, we're going after ordinary people, and this is just a futile effort, so we have to give up. And, and I think that was a mistake. Um, and the reason is because, well, the three times a day someone's eating animals is a problem for the animal rights movement, for sure. It's also an opportunity for us to show people in a positive way how there are very, very easy steps they can take to be a part of the movement. The question is whether we take an inclusive or an exclusive framing. And that relates to the second big shift I've seen in the last 20 years. And I just actually blogged about this um, on The Simple Heart. I have a Substack, a blog called The Simple Heart. And I wrote about the impact of Peter Singer over the last 20 years. And I think one of the things that Peter Singer's done that I think is really good, even when I've disagreed with him on the specifics, is shifted the framing of the animal rights movement away from just individual change, like what diet are we adopting, towards systemic change? What policies, institutions, cultures are we propagating collectively? Who holds power and who doesn't hold power, right? And, and that has caused many, many shifts in the way animal rights movements Think, I mean, animal rights organizations think about activism. Um, so for example, if you're really thinking about this as a systemic problem and you have analysis about power, not just personal purity and rectitude, but power, someone like a slaughterhouse worker may not be a villain. They may be a victim or even an ally, right? And, and 15 years ago, even 10 years ago, animal rights organizations that are doing investigations like ours would think it's successful when we put one of these slaughterhouse workers in prison. You know, a lot of times they get deported because they're almost always immigrants, often undocumented immigrants. They're only taking these jobs because they have no other jobs available. I mean, working at a slaughterhouse is one of the most dangerous jobs in the world. Uh, at the slaughterhouse, we just had a court case in Merced, California, Foster Farms. I think an ambulance comes at slaughterhouse. I believe it's every other day. There's an, a medical emergency for a human being. Why? Because this is a place of violence. <laughs> where they have blades and scalding tanks and all sorts of devices of torture and killing. And guess what? If a worker moves their hands slightly in the wrong way, 
a worker bumps into another worker and they run into a device called the MK3 killer. That's the name of the actual device inside the Foster Farm Slaughterhouse in Merced, California. It's called an MK3 killer. It kills 180 birds every single minute, but it also could kill or tear up the arm off a human being. And that happens, you know, twice a week or, or three times a week, every week. And in understanding that these workers are not in a position of power, in many ways, if you take a power analysis, systems analysis, if you look at them individually, I'm not saying that they're not doing something wrong. They are. And, and I'm not saying we should say they're not, that deny that they're doing something wrong. We should say that. But when we're looking at social change and strategic impact, they are not in any position of power to change those things. Frankly, the average consumer on the street who's buying, you know, free range meat from Whole Foods or, or Safeway or some major retailer, Costco, has more power to actually help animals than a slaughterhouse worker who's only taking that job is risking their own life, their own limbs to slaughter these animals because they have nothing else available to them. And in contrast, the upper middle class shopper in a grocery store actually does have some power to shift from eating meat to eating plant-based. But granted, if you take the systems analysis even further, you recognize it's not really about the upper middle class meat eater or the slaughterhouse worker. It's about the systems that are shaping both of them. And there's a lot more we can say about that, but I, I have a talk called The Science of Social Change that people can check out if they're interested. And the blog I write, the Simple Heart blog, is really all about what the systems analysis means. You know, what, it, what does it mean for us as people are trying to make the world a better place? How do we think about institutions and norms and policies and cultures in our own autonomy and not just autonomy, but power and trying to challenge these destructive systems? And, and I think when you shift that framing, you suddenly are able to achieve success, both as an individual activist and collective as a movement that you didn't think was possible beforehand, because it allows you to mobilize so much more public support, you know, that 99% of people eating animals, they can be seen as potential allies rather than adversaries. It allows you to find the root causes of a lot of these things. And, and there's enormous amount of social scientific research showing that if you actually want to change people, Changing their minds is often less important than changing their views of what the public at large thinks, right? Because we're social animals, we tend to adopt social norms. And if there's a law that says something, we'll probably comply with the law. If there's a cool set of pants, I remember like five years ago, 10 years ago, when people started wearing skinny jeans, I was like, those look so awful. I have no idea why people wear such tight clothes. They look incredibly uncomfortable. Now, now five years later, I wear skinny jeans every single day of my life. I have no idea how that happened. I never like them, but I'm wearing them every day. And why is that? Because I'm a social animal. And eventually when everyone else around me thinks something, I just think, oh yeah, I'm gonna do this too. And I actually even like them kind of now. I don't, I don't know what happened to me because I used to hate them, but that's true of everything in human cognition. And we have to embrace and accept and understand that if we wanna be effective activists. And I think the movement has changed over the last 20 years to do exactly that. Sorry, that was a long rant. No, that was great. Well said. Um, and Wayne, you, one of your articles you wrote was called on the importance of at open rescue. So can you talk about why you think open rescue is one of the most important forms of activism and what is open rescue for people who don't know? Yeah, open rescue is in my view, not only the most important tactic, but the most important strategy for animal rights, because it creates immense systemic change. And, and let me say what open rescue is and explain why I think open rescue creates systemic change. Open rescue is the act of, of going into a facility that is mistreating animals, documenting what has happened to an individual. And the individual is important um, because we need to personify the animals and show that these are, are living beings, not things. That, and there's evidence showing that even if you talk about two individuals, compassion fatigue sets in and, and people are less willing to give, for example, two to two starving children than one. It doesn't really make any sense because you might think, wait, there's two starving kids. Shouldn't you have more empathy? But because the human brain just struggles. I mean, it's it's a struggle to understand even one other person. Like we have these huge brains and huge frontal lobes that are engaged in theory of mind, trying to imagine what it's like to be someone else. Imagine the feelings of one person. Any of us who have been in a relationship know it's hard to even understand one person. You know? <laughs> Once you add two, the human brain sort of falls apart. So we usually focus on one individual uh, and we give them aid, we rescue them. And then the last piece is we're transparent about it. We document everything we do to the world. And uh, the reason I say this is crucial systemic change is one, it is it is the best battleground for us to fight on policy and culture and norms, because the emotional and narrative appeal of an individual who's suffering, right? Again, because the identifiable victim effect, when there's one individual, people empathize more. When it's an individual who clearly is in distress, who, who needs assistance, there's a natural compassion, I think, in all of us that 
pulls at our heartstrings. It's why the Dodo and Woof Woof, two of the largest Facebook pages in the world, are just focused on animal rescue because people love watching cute animals get rescued. They just love it. But the second thing about it is it's not just the narrative appeal that allows us to, to fight the background on, on, the, on the norms, the issues, the policies, the ethical propositions of animal rights in the most sympathetic way for us. And we always have to choose. This is something from Sun Tzu, right? Choose your battleground. Don't, don't fight on issues like, you know, if, if we're fighting about what foods people should eat, that's a hard battleground because people like to eat what they want to eat. If we fight about should an animal who's literally collapsed on the ground, starving to death on the floor of a factory farm been given aid, that is a background that's very strategically useful for us. That's one where we can win with almost everybody. But the second thing about it is, and this relates to the point I just made about you know, food versus animal abuse, it is a battleground where we're fighting a systemic fight and not an individual fight. Because when we're talking about an individual animal who's collapsed on the ground, starving to death, that is a question of policy. That is a question of practices at factory farms. That is a question of the appropriate treatment or mistreatment of animals. It's not a question about what individuals should be doing, right? And so what, what that means concretely is that 99% of people who are three times a day are financially and physically supporting animal abuse. And really it's 100% of people because you pay your taxes, you're probably supporting animal abuse. Every nation that I've looked at on this planet subsidizes animal abuse through government funding. So it's 100% of us. All of us who are supporting animal abuse, but including the people who eat animals, can feel like, all right, I eat animals, but I'm not okay with that. You know, and I'm not feeling personally attacked. Like the cognitive dissonance avoidance that usually sets in when you talk about veganism doesn't set in. And, and that's been proven in some of the recent court cases. We've won two court cases now in very conservative areas where there are not many vegans, where people cited with a radical animal rights act as breaking into farms and taking animals out rather than with the animal abusing industries that are feeding them three times a day because they didn't see our actions as attacking them. They saw our actions as supporting the things that they believe in too, including giving aid to animals who are suffering in factory farms. Mm. Interesting. So in those cases, the people voted for the rescuers. Yeah. Because so it distanced unanimously. itself from it. Yeah. Yeah. Well. It's, you know, it, it made them closer to it and it distanced them from it in terms of blame, right? Mm -hmm. It made them closer in the sense that focusing on the individual, every single person in that jury room in Utah you know, we played little videos of little Lily, just a baby pig hobbling around, barely able to walk, starving to death, you know, giving her a bath, giving her medication. And, you know, I could see like the smiles on the jurors faces and I could see, I mean, these are conservative Trump supporting jurors in rural Utah. Right. And they're looking at this and they're thinking, oh, you know, I like that baby pig, too. I don't want to hurt, you know, because it's just who hasn't read Charlotte's Web and cried? Who hasn't watch Babe the Pig, or even like Finding Nemo. Finding Nemo is like an animal liberation movie. It's all about like, you got to break into someone's home and steal their fish because the fish deserve to be free. <laughs> and all these little kids are like, yeah, go, you know, break in and free the fish. Um, so there's a natural sympathy and it makes you closer to it because when you look at mass suffering, it's almost objectifying to the animals. It's, it's a way to detach yourself from the suffering of, of the animals or human beings for that matter. Because again, it's hard. It's, it's like, the old saying that a million deaths is a statistic, one death is a tragedy, right? And, and so it brings them emotionally closer to the suffering of animals. But it also does remove them from responsibility because the, the evildoer is seen as a corporate CEO, a corporation, an institution, a norm, a government. While, and it gives room for people to say, uh, I don't have to be a part of this. And I, I'm not a part of this because I, I, I was not someone who supported and liked the fact that a baby pig was left to starve to death on the floor of a factory farm. Instead, I'm going to be part of the solution. I'm going to be the person who votes on a jury to make sure that baby pigs never starve to death on the floor of factory farms. And while that might seem like a small step concretely in the scheme of the billions of animals who are suffering and dying, the, the moral and political and legal precedent set by that, you know, imagine instead of one baby pig, we have thousands of them being saved across the country by activists who are all being acquitted. That is the sort of pressure that can be placed not just on the industry, but on our culture and our moral institutions that can cause this entire house of cards, this notion that the animals of this earth are just things for us to use and abuse, to collapse, collapse in a heap of hypocrisy and lies. And so that's the long-term vision. If we build not just dozens, but hundreds and thousands of individuals going to these places, rescuing animals, being acquitted at trial, then the entire industry will collapse and be transformed into one that actually is in comportment with the values of ordinary people who don't want to see animals suffering violence. Mm. Yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. And psychologically, that's fascinating. Um, 
So let's talk animal or plant-based trends. Um, I wanted to ask you both what you thought of, you know, we're seeing a decline of sales in plant-based companies of revenue. And meanwhile, we're also seeing an increase in animal consumption here in the West. Um, I mean, cows and other animals, we're seeing a decrease in consumption, but chickens is at an all-time high. In developing countries, we're seeing more people eating animals because they're pulling themselves out of poverty. They can afford to eat more animals. So I wanted to ask you, Dushan, what do you make of these trends where, you know, the revenue of plant-based companies is falling, animal consumption is increasing, is the vegan movement becoming stagnant or what's happening here? That's why I do politics, to be honest, because I don't think that uh, individual choices in capitalists can really make change. If you, if you see at concrete cases, if you look at the concrete cases, like in Great Britain, there was even this, uh, because of the big, uh, big short, big, sorry, uh, sometimes when I tired, my English gets bad, so you no may have to cut this. But uh, there was in uh, UK because there weren't enough sales of uh, cow's milk because of the trend of plant-based milk. One of the farms uh, went bankrupt basically, but then it got bailed by uh, a government. And that's the problem of politics and individual consumer choices cannot really solve that because a lot of these big big meat uh, milk egg companies are sponsors to the politicians who get elected and then in favor the politicians give them subsidize get bail them out just like with the banks you know it's literally the, the same principle and that's why one of the first points in our program regarding animal uh, liberation uh, is going to be immediate stop subsidizing any of animal uh, farms mm. and help them make the transition uh, to, to plant-based. Uh, so what you said is very true. Uh, also in the global south, the, because of the bigger money, uh, money power, uh, people are consuming more animals. Uh, so that's why I think, uh, yeah, I watched Wayne's uh, theory of social change as well. And he talks about this, if I'm uh, correct, 3.5% that people uh, need to rebel uh, in order to make a certain social change and in order to make a structural radical change. And I believe in that as well, especially if we combine politics with grassroots activism and, and stuff like that. And listen, if you go for like a couple of hundreds of years ago, or even a hundred years ago, if you try to abolish uh, slavery, you wouldn't, you couldn't do it if you try to, um, try to make people believe one by one that uh, mm. slavery shouldn't be owned. Mm -hmm. You need to make a structural change in terms of policy. And I think unfortunately, well, it's not even unfortunately because with uh, this rising level of uh, natalism, a lot of new people are being born each day. We don't have time to make them all vegan one by one. You know, that's why mm. it needs to be a com complete structural change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm hearing from both of you that it's far, it goes way beyond individual change. You know, it goes beyond getting everyone to become vegan. These are structural, there are structural systemic forces at play here that are controlling, like animal agriculture lobbyists are controlling governments and they're subsidizing these in industries. So if people didn't buy, they would still be subsidized and that milk would still go somewhere. And that's, yeah, those are really interesting points. Um, Wayne, can I, I want to make one quick yep. point on that, just because I think yeah. this is this is a really important conversation, okay. and it's a really important question. Because I think you're right. I mean, a lot of these metrics look like they're going the wrong direction, and and I will say, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, we're accountable to the animals. Like as as activists, you know, my my organization's mission, the Simple Heart DXC's mission, um, Direct Action Over's mission, is is about being accountable to the animals and and. And centering these kind of individuals who have no power in the system, you know, they have no power. Um, and the fact that there is rising per capita meat consumption, there are more animals being killed in the United States and in the industrialized world is, is a very bad metric. 
But, and this is a very, very important but, if we're actually looking at our long-term political power, I actually don't think that metric matters very much. And other metrics like, what sort of legislation are we able to pass? You know, we just had a Supreme Court argument in the United States where Supreme Court justices said uh, an argument, including a very conservative Supreme Court justice, Neil Gorsuch, wrote about how the ag industry is basically corrupt and buying our politicians off. I mean, if that's not exactly what Neil Gorsuch said in his opinion, but it's pretty close. Mm -hmm. um, we had a bunch of justices arguing about whether pigs should be in crates and whether that is a moral interest that is legitimately important that it justifies you know, basically interfering with interstate commerce. We had these precedential court verdicts in Utah and California that were publicized in the most important publication in the world, New York Times. And we have plant-based foods available at every Burger King in the nation, which is at least thousands of restaurants. Um, and But the concrete example I want to give, and, and so what is the metric we should be using? It's, it's actually the rule 3.5%. It's like how many people or actively or passively supporting our movement, and how many people are actively or passively opposing our movement. Um, if we can get to about, at, right, frankly, I don't even think we need 3.5%, but a significant percentage of people engaged in sustained nonviolent direct action, we will win, almost guaranteed. You know, this is Erica Chanelis' work at Harvard. Um, and so that's a metric that I really care about. You know, how much active opposition do we have? How much passive opposition? And this is, you know, the spectrum of allies. It's classic nonviolence, you know, one-on-one stuff. Um, but just to give you one concrete example, though, of how the metrics of, of like buying and selling things don't really matter, uh, many of you probably know that California became the first state in the nation to ban the sale of fur outright in, in, in our state in 2019. And, and you know, uh, I don't want to toot my own horn, but I was kind of lead organizer in that campaign. And we worked with a bunch of different groups, but, you know, we, we definitely, we passed the first ban in San Francisco, Berkeley, then San Francisco, then we got in California. And some LA activists did a separate ban in LA before we got in California. But if you look at the pelts produced in the United States leading up to that first ban in San Francisco, and I think 2017, um, I'm looking at the numbers right now. In 2014, we were at record high levels in the United States of pelts being produced. Right. Mm -hmm. So the numbers are looking like they're going in the wrong direction. And within two years, we've banned it in California. And now fur sales have dropped off a cliff in the United States from 2014, when they were at 3.8 million to the most recent numbers in 2020, it's not 1.4 million. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like one third of the amount. Um, and if you just looked at numbers, um, can I share my screen even? I wonder if there's, <laughs> I would love to share this um... chart. I don't know it's if you okay need to be a co-host. I... Don't worry about it. It doesn't matter. What I'll just, okay. I'll just use my fingers. All right. Okay. It looks like things are getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And then we win in California. And, and now you have all these retailers dropping fur. You have fur bans being proposed all over the country. And now it looks like this, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you see the same in many other movements. This is not just animal rights, right? If you look at the gay rights movement, if you look at women's rights movement, Bloomberg did a, a really good kind of analysis of how social change happens. Um, I don't even know why Bloomberg of all publications did yeah. this. It's because it, Bloomberg is a business publication, but they did this really, I think, why did they do this? But it was a really good analysis, whatever they did. And what and they showed the same thing in the struggle for women's suffrage and the struggle for, for gay rights and the struggle for, for civil rights. It's all like, you know, bing, 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 bing. Sometimes it even seems like things are getting worse. And then suddenly, there's massive change because you hit that critical threshold and everything changes. Um, so mm -hmm. I just think going back to the theories of change that, that we were talking about earlier in this conversation, if our theory of change is not everybody goes vegan one by one and, and then the world changes and all the animals are liberated and everyone's happy, then honestly, the metrics, I'm not saying we shouldn't look at those metrics and we shouldn't care about them because in the long term, that metric needs a change. But, uh, but also in the long term, the metrics that will most predict whether we can change that number permanently in the long term actually are not how many vegans and vegetarians and how many animals are being eaten today, but rather how much political and moral and social power we have, which is better measured by the amount of people who are engaged with the movement in a positive way. So that, that I think is a more important metric. And I do look at those numbers. I think they are concerning. Um, they're also evidence that our efforts at vegan advocacy just haven't worked. Like even if you do believe in the vegan consumer movement over the last 30 years, we just haven't had a lot of success. But in contrast with political movements, you know, things like the California fur ban, like Prop 12, we've had enormous success and unprecedented success that the animal rights movement in the United States has never had before. Well, on the one hand, that's very heartening. And that's, it's an interesting point. Cause I think for me, sometimes I do get a little bit narrow-minded in my view and 
those kind of metrics are the ones that I look at. And so, yeah, that's heartening to, to hear that in some ways. Um, I just want to switch gears a little bit. Okay, Wayne, you just shared something. We can share this in, uh, in the video description. It's just a um, chart of how it increases, increases, increases. And then, in, you know, be, uh, frankly, right around the time we started organizing politically, it suddenly drops off the cliff because we won. Mm, cool. Yeah, we'll share that as well. Um, so, Dushan, I wanted to ask you about one of the articles you wrote. Um, you wrote that there is the right winger's identity obsession with meat on the one side and leftist trivial excuses on the other. So with this quote, I wanted to ask you, how do we facilitate real political action on this issue when both sides seem to be so resistant? Where do we even begin? Well, I think we, we all live in a society, that famous say, saying, you know, so uh, there is this famous myth of normality, naturality and necessity of consuming animal products that definitely needs to be destroyed because it's a myth, basically. Regarding uh, right-wingers, I mentioned that because there are really several and very, very good studies about how they identify masculinity hierarchy with oppression of animals and with eating animals. And uh, yeah, uh, regarding trivial excuses by leftists, just to elaborate more on that, before I answer the concrete question, there is this also myth, if you ask me, that uh, veganism is classist and ableist. First of all, the very definition of veganism is as far as possible and practicable, uh, not to consume uh, animal, animal products or uh, visit zoos and, and so on and so on. This is not apologetic in any sense. We were talking about the structures, but I think both me and Wayne believe that people should go vegan, even though the structure is uh, the one we are attacking the most. And uh, I always joke uh, with my fellow leftists who are not vegan, you are talking about changing the world, but you cannot even uh, change what you eat for breakfast. So I think we should we should make those changes while fighting, fighting the system as well. Uh, on the other hand, uh, how we can make this uh, into a concrete fight? I think Steve Best said that animal rights are somewhere in the leftist movement, but they are usually at the very end of the bus and they should be uh, driving the bus. You know why? Because that's the first discrimination that we learn in our home. And that's the biggest hierarchy dispersion that we have in comparison to others. So when you look at the right wingers, they probably uh, have think they are much bigger beings than Jewish people, than uh, black people. But it all started with that mouse or with that chicken that they eat uh, for, for dinner. And even if you look in a psychological, linguistical sense, uh, there are always these derogatory terms in various languages, like uh, women are called chicks, uh, or in some languages, fish, and so on and so on. So it's this, if we break uh, the hate and discrimination of animals, there wouldn't be such thing as dehumanization. Because there is no thing that you can lower the people to that extent if you just break the hierarchy. And I think that's the main goal. In social psychology, there is this notion that I think is even not subordinated, but backbone of capitalism. It's called social dominance orientation. It's the belief uh, that hierarchies are something that is just and something that is necessary. And uh, that psychological construct can predict racism, speciesism, which is discrimination to non-human animals, sexism, and all other discriminations. And it correlates a lot with all of them. It even has a mediating role. So I think it's easier to get to anarchists, for example, first. And there is even this term, veganarchist, that was coined some, sometime in the 80s even, I think. 
and then we are together in changing the whole system as we talked uh, all, all this time 3.5 percent we need to unite social movements like direct action everywhere uh with radical left political parties like meta 25s which are uh dm 25s political parties and then we need to push it from all 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 fronts mm -hmm. yeah for sure um, Wayne, you wrote about the importance of free speech earlier in our conversation, you, you touched on this, but you said one of the informal mottos of direct action everywhere um, is speak the truth, even if your voice shakes. Why is free speech so important and why is it important for animal rights activism? Yeah, you know, um, I, I blogged about this in Simple Heart. I, I, I made a blog post a while back about why activists should defend free speech, even by our enemies. Um, and I have a, I have a nice picture of Donald Trump because <laughs> I, I think this even extends to Donald Trump. You know I mean? I, we can't think of anyone in the United States who at least people on the left think more of as an adversary than Donald Trump. Um, but I, I will say, I agree with those who think it is extremely concerning that he was deplatformed from Twitter, Twitter and Facebook. Um, and, and let me explain why, uh, the free speech is, is is crucial to those first and foremost who don't have power because <laughs> those who have power like donald trump himself they're going to be able to speak regardless right even when donald trump was deplatformed from twitter and and facebook he still had plenty of ways to reach millions and millions of americans he was not thrown in jail he was just taken off of twitter and Pla and facebook he might think well then what's the point you know what what does it matter and, and, and the reason there is a point and the reason it doesn't matter is because we have to operate by principles. That's the nature of institutions, right? You can't, you can't completely arbitrarily decide. And this is the nature of anti-speciesism too. We operate by principles. We can't say, well, you're a dog, so I'm going to take care of you, but you're a pig and in all other ways, you're basically equal, but I'm going to decide to torture you and give you a, a, a you know, doggy treat, right? That's an inconsistency. That's a principle we violate. And similarly, free speech has to operate by principles. It can't just be we let people speak when we like them and we don't let them speak when we don't like them. Because if we set up that principle, the people of power will allow all the people we don't like to speak, <laughs> all the people of enormous power and wealth and influence who want to destroy the planet and want to kill animals will have plenty of opportunities to speak. And those of us who don't have a lot of power because we're ragtag grassroots activists trying to challenge these industries will be thrown in prison. And that's exactly what the industry has tried to do, right? With ag gag laws across the country, with prosecutions of actors like me and my friends. And, and so it's very important for us to take a principled stand and say, look, as a society, you know, we need to give people, all people, the right to express their opinions, at least. I mean, obviously, we believe there are other rights that every sentient being should have, but that is a minimal right for at least people engage in the democratic discourse. The other reason, and, and I write about this in this blog post, um, you know, which is called "Why We Should Defend Speech, Free Speech Even by Our Enemies," um, and I, you know, I, in that spirit, I encourage disagreement with that. I'd love to hear what people think about that and and why we should have defended Facebook and Twitter's decision. And for the record, Facebook and Twitter and these big tech companies have not been good for animals or the environment at all, in my view. And we, that could be a longer conversation. But in general, we should not be supporting their their decisions and their corporate policies because they they don't have much of an interest in helping anyone other than their, their corporate profits. Uh, but the other reason I'm very confident free speech is going to help animals is because I think that when, when you are right morally about a situation, I do think there is right and wrong. Hopefully all activists and all people think that there is a way for us to get the right answers in terms of moral thinking. Um, more discourse is good. <laughs> that your greatest fear is that we don't talk about it at all, right? It, again, it, it's very hard to justify a system that subjects baby animals to mutilation, torture, and starvation. And yet this routinely happens to literally tens of millions of pigs, hundreds of millions of chickens every single year in the United States. Um, and so one of our overarching goals has to be to have these conversations. And free speech will facilitate that. It may allow people to debate us and disagree with us, like Trump. You know, Trump is, is a big supporter of big meat. He loves talking about steaks and hamburgers. I think there's even like a Trump steak you can buy. Um, but let's encourage that conversation if we have confidence in our views. And this is why we have to speak our truth, because when you have a truth, the biggest fear is that you silence yourself or someone else silences you. 
it's not that other someone else contradicts you because if someone else contradicts you and they're right, great. Let's figure that out. Because maybe, maybe maybe you can refine your truth and realize, oh, you know what? I used to say, and I actually used to say this, that torturing animals for food and entertainment and fur is one thing, but you know, vivisection, you're trying to save lives. And I, I still see a hierarchy. There's a difference, you know. I mean, yeah, we shouldn't torture animals for stupid reasons, but if you're trying to cure cancer or you know, diabetes or some support important disease, you know, we are smarter than them, right? Right. But but I had people challenge me, including Singer himself. Singer has written a piece um, and, and defended what he calls, and this is a, a terrible framing for the argument, the argument for marginal cases. And the idea is, you know, well, if you really think intelligence is a standard for moral status, there are a lot of human beings who aren't quote unquote intelligent. Does that mean we can torture them just because we're smarter than them? You know, an infant. Um, I had a good friend growing up who had a very severe mental disability, still lives with his parents. He has a cognitive ability of about a five-year-old. Does that mean I could torture him and his parents could use him or kill him just because he's less intelligent? Of course not. That's preposterous because we realize his suffering still matters. In many ways, it matters more, right? Because when when if there's a vulnerable being that can't rationalize away their suffering, and this is an argument for almost like caring more about the suffering of non-human animals and mentally disabled human beings. Those of us who have intelligence, like I can explain away all my suffering. You know, if if... If I have a mom who's diagnosed with cancer, I can rationalize and say, well, like there are all these things we can do about it. Um, she's not going to die immediately. Your, our big brains give us the opportunity to rationalize the suffering away. Well, a, a living being who's living in a more moment to moment existence, they can't do that, right? They suffer much more immensely. And the bigger point though, is when we have these conversations, I think we get, we get to progress. And free speech is one of the canonical principles that will allow us to have those conversations. So, so I think we have to defend it. Mm -hmm. Just to add, if I may, uh, because uh, Wayne just opened an important topic. And yes, uh, I agree. And I would just add that we are the ones, we as humans in this anthropocentric world, are the ones that are even defining intelligence, you know? So, crowd. Dolphins are probably much more intelligent uh, than most of humans, even in uh, some areas that humans define to be a sense of intelligence. But, uh, you know, one can say, can a cat drive a car? No, but does cat really need a car? So it's all how you define the intelligence as well. And uh, I did my bachelor thesis actually on uh, using animals in uh, science for exp uh, experimentation. And the data shows that 90 percent of uh, experiments that are being done on animals do not produce any significant results. Wow. And when I say significant, I mean you cannot even quote that result. You cannot even uh, have it for volunteers on humans. So it's garbage. 90 percent of, of uh, uh, experimentation on, on, on human animals. Wow. Do you have that paper that you can share with us and we can link? It's or? in Montenegro. <laughs> okay. But, and, uh, I, I have, the, of course, the reference to, to this study, which states that about the 90%. Okay. Okay. Wow. That's really interesting. Um, and we're kind of getting close to time here, but I wanted to ask you guys something a little bit more controversial. You mentioned him a few times, Peter Singer. Um, so... Wayne, you actually, you did a live stream yesterday where you talked, you did a video praising Peter Singer. And one of the questions that you got was, didn't Peter say he's not vegan? And for those who don't know, Peter Singer is a philosopher. He's considered the father of the animal rights movement, and he's a utilitarian. So he's described as a utilitarian vegan where he advocates for a more reductionist approach. And he has been quoted as saying he's a flexible vegan. So for example, when he's traveling, he might not be vegan or if he's going to a friend's house or a restaurant, he might not, you know, he might indulge and, and eat animals or animal products. Um, so Wayne, what your response to this commenter saying, didn't Peter say he's not vegan? You said he's still more vegan to me because he's had more impact for the animals. And I wanted to ask you, but do you think he's even still relevant today? Because there are a lot of vegans who are 
more principled and they adhere to veganism and and he you know just because he he has been so influential doesn't necessarily mean that it's useful to draw on today and another thing i wanted to add was in terms of veganism do you think it dilutes the movement a bit when you're calling yourself a flexible vegan so I mean, let me ask you that first what, what what are your thoughts on all this but for for the record uh, i yeah. love controversial questions so it's, okay I, okay do awesome. not do not apologize for that i love these sorts of questions okay um, all right, so so let me um so let me just back up and say I, I'm very confident that Peter Singer does not eat animals at all. So it, the question, and I don't think he eats like straight up dairy products. I think the question is hmm. like if there's bread that has some you know some like mono or diglycerides it's from an animal origin, right? Or it might be more than that. It might be even whey or like even butterfat. I don't know. I, and hmm. and honestly, I don't know where he is now. I know there's been a lot of back and forth on this. And honestly, you raised the best con argument to his approach already, which is people, and, and Dushan said the same, that people will attack you as a hypocrite, that if you're trying to be an activist and they don't see you, you know, uh, I, I think Dushan, the way you put it is like, if you can't even change your breakfast, how are you going to build the road, right? Or something like that. <laughs> so it's a good point, you know? And I think that's the reason, like, I, I am a pretty stringent vegan, you know? I, I, yeah, like if, I'll try to avoid mono and diglycerides if if I can find out whether they're of animal origin. I mean, I don't always, to be honest. And I, I used to be much more stringent than I am today. Like I used to be stringent to the point, like I wouldn't read books because of um the 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 glue being used coming from or, oh, or, wow. I used to there was a year of my life where I tried to avoid anything with a rubber tire. I would not sit in a bus or get in a car because of the stearic acid in tires. For those of you who don't know. Rubber is still made from a compound called, I think it's, um, it's well, it's stearic acid, but there's some compound they made from stearic acid. But stearic acid often comes from bull testicles. You know, mm -hmm. they, they pull from an animal origin. And so, you know, if you're sitting in a car with a rubber tire, like there's an, there's an animal who suffered to make that car. And, and so all of us are drawing the line somewhere. Um, and I think to me, the most important thing is that we signal to the world that we're making an effort. Uh, Peter disagrees with that. He, he thinks, and I think the argument, and I think this is where people don't understand, his disagreement is not just about personal indulgence. His personal, his his disagreement with me and you probably from the way you're asking this question, because I do disagree with him and it sounds like you disagree with him too, is about strategic impact. And his point is this, that if we build a movement where everyone who is sitting in a bus or drives a car or opens a book with um, glue that has collagen from, you know, from animals, like, because I know there's some glue, and I think actually books often have collagen in like the paper, the glue mm -hmm. that sticks the pages together from collagen um, of some sort that comes from animal origin. If we say like, hey, if you read a book, you're not a part of the movement. <laughs> We're not going to have a lot of people supporting us, right? Um, and, and Peter just takes that further and says, well, you know, I'm not going to just say that about the, the people who read books. I'm going to also say that about the people who eat mono and diglycerides in their bread. Or, or even whey, you know, there's like a whey ingredient in their protein powder, and maybe they don't even know it, but it's an animal origin. It's a protein powder that's really worked for them. It's really important to them. Maybe they're even delusional about it and they don't really need that protein powder, but they're not going to be animal rights activists unless we let them in, even though they're eating a protein powder with whey. And um, I think the general sentiment behind that, which is to try and build an inclusive movement and not condemn people as much for their personal choices is a good one. I don't agree with the line he's drawn because because I think it is important, especially for leaders in the movement like me and him, um, him much more than me because he's way more influential than I am. And, you know, um, but I think it's important for leaders to show we're trying harder. And um, so but I guess the last thing I'd say is I think what Peter talks about is something a lot of vegans do. They just don't say it. <laughs> so one one thing about Peter is he admits the things he does. Like mm -hmm. him or hate him, he's a very, very refreshingly honest person. And I think there are a lot of vegans out there, including leaders who are also not that stringent, you know, who are, there's, I'll just, I, I'm going to be trying to, trying to be honest too, is, and say, I have a mouthwash at home now. I don't even know where I got it, but there's only a little bit left, <laughs> but that mouthwash, I'm pretty sure is not, is not verified, not tested on animals. I, I mm -hmm. usually have mouthwash in my house. But I think someone just left mouthwash in my house like a couple of years ago. And I use so little mouthwash. So I've, I've always had this mouthwash. And every I use mouthwash like every two weeks or so. I don't even know why I use it. I just said, eh, I should try this, you know? And it's a mouthwash that's not tested on animals. 
you know, and I think we should be open about these things and, and say like, and, and be open to critique too. If someone wants to come to me and say, Wayne, that's not cool. Like you should have thrown that away, given that away you're, you're trying to teach people to open rescue animals and you can't even find a cruelty-free mouthwash. What's wrong with you, dude? You know, I think that's like a fair critique, but I also think for us to get to the point where we're having fair critiques of people, we should be honest. And I appreciate Peter's honesty about this. Yeah. I think what's interesting though, is like you say, what line, where are we drawing the line? And I think we should be honest, but I also think no one is expecting perfect. I mean, the examples you mentioned are are so crazy. I mean, they're so over the top that I didn't even think about the books thing, you know, that's something that I didn't even consider. But with Peter is the way that he says his position makes me think it goes much more than that. So when he he was quoted in an interview as saying, he's okay with indulging yourself if you're going to a fancy restaurant. So I don't necessarily, I don't think that he's thinking to the point where you are. So I think he's giving himself a little bit more leeway. But again, has anyone, I would like to hear what he has to say. So I'm not sure. Dushan, what, what do you think? Well, uh, yeah, <laughs> that sounds scary, to be honest, indulging in a restaurant. But I heard that as well. Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, when, when I said at the very beginning uh, that veganism means excluding as far as possible and practicable animal products, uh, it's not possible and practicable not to drive with the car or on a bus, at least in my country, you know, but uh, it's definitely possible uh, and practicable to stay out of uh, animal, uh, animal based uh, food, if you ask me. So it's even this perspective, I don't think that m many people can understand that, especially those maybe listeners that are not vegan, but there is this change in perspective that happens to you once you become vegan. You don't really see that as a food, at least me. I, I, when I look at the trees, I see a screaming cow still the six years after I, I went vegan, you know? And I spent a lot of hours in front of the slaughterhouse with the animals, same woman and stuff like that. And if I ate something, I would just feel probably both physically and mentally crushed. And that's this uh, power of changing your perception because once you see animals as human, as, as beings, as sentient beings, sorry, and not as a food or product, then you realize that all of your life until that point, you had someone's leg in your plate and you, had no idea about it, even though it sounds uh, like, where, what do you think? Do animals grow on the, on the tree? Uh, no, trust me, a lot of people have no idea about that. They know it cognitively on the surface, but they don't really make the connection with the animal. Yeah, yeah, that's such a good point about perception. Like you, I feel the same way, you know, when you see an animal on someone's plate, you don't see it as food anymore. It's just, it's not even a food. It's not even a temptation because it's not food to you. And for me, that mentally and physically, it repulses me. So I think having that stance of, you know, when Peter's saying he indulges, I think that just shows that he still views animals as a commodity, as something to consume. So, I mean, yeah, it's really interesting. And we are running out of time. I would love to talk about this further, but, um, we're reaching the top of the hour. I wanted to ask you both one final question. What is one piece of advice that you would give to animal rights activists today to impact change? Wayne, do you need I'll, time? I'll give, <laughs> I'll give three pieces of advice, but in 10 okay. words. And these, okay. these are the words I always give activists. Find your voice, find some friends, and fight like hell. That's it. I those are the that. 10 words. And I could explain a lot more each of them. But just if you listen to those words, you'll do a lot of good for the world. That's great. Thank you. Dushan? Wayne said it perfectly. Now yeah. I can't <laughs> top it. But he uh, put the standards high. <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, I would say the same. Organize, feel the animals, and remember that this is probably the fastest growing social movement ever. Mm -hmm. And the only social movement that does not fight for themselves but for the others and that's our power not our weakness 
You're here. That's You're wonderful. Here. Yeah. Thank you both so much. And we'll just leave it at that. I really Thanks. appreciate you joining me today. Thank you. Thanks a lot. It was a pleasure.